thank you everyone for joining who has joined for this lecture set of lectures so as i mentioned in the morning my name is prasanna uh, and uh, i'll be talking about bose einstein condensates um, so uh, here is just a couple of organizing things uh, because there were a lot of registrants i thought i wanted to have a slightly different email id just in case i miss uh, in my regular email id some of the emails and questions you have so this is an email address that you can write to especially regarding questions regarding this this set of lectures that's one thing but now i see there are not so many people so i think it's also okay if you just email me on my uh, official itgm address that's okay too um and so before i go into this picture let me just briefly uh, give you the plan of how i'm going to run these lectures so um we'll begin with an introduction uh, the introduction will be of course the key question for anything that you you start studying or learning about why the hell do you do it right so without that uh, it, it it's a bit hard so uh, i'll begin with some motivation for what's interesting about bose einstein condensates which will in turn require me to roughly tell you what bees is b what bose einstein condensates which will be for short i'll call them bees what bees are and uh, then the second thing i will do uh, most of it today hopefully is answer this question of what is a bose einstein condensate and that is the point where we will begin um, our sort of theoretical description of a bose einstein condensate and we will go into two slightly complementary descriptions one of which might be somewhat familiar to you if you've taken an graduate course or msc course in statistical mechanics and a slightly less familiar version of it uh, which will introduce some of the mathematical machinery needed to go on to the third thing i'll talk about which is how do you theoretically describe a bose einstein condensate there will be two descriptions i'll try and cover one will be using uh, what's called a mean field theory or gross pitevsky equation and then a little bit about fluctuations about this mean field so my hope is that i would get through these two topics to by today and somewhat uh, around half of tomorrow and then we will begin this sometime late tomorrow and if there is some time by the fourth lecture we will i'll i'll discuss a little bit about the connection between superfluidity and bose einstein condensation which is a very important topic historically and also now more current uh, experiments that have been going on and irrespective of how much of the theoretical machinery and the theoretical uh, background i cover by uh, the first four lecture i will i would have enough uh, uh, sort of uh, and we would have enough background at the point when we finish four lectures to have a fifth lecture which will be a little bit different it will not be a, a chalkboard or like a writing uh, like like i'm going to be just writing on this ipad it will be a different kind of a lecture the last one will be a little bit like a, i i'll give a talk uh, essentially covering a couple of very important experiments one of which is regarding bose one set of experiments regarding bose einstein condensates in optical lattice and another one concerning bose einstein condensates in an optical cavity so the former is historically really important and it's one of the big success stories of bose einstein condensates so it serves to give you an exposure to what are the possibilities with bose einstein condensates the second one is essentially again uh, uh, something that is very close to uh, my research interests and hopefully that will be uh, inspiring for some of you to uh, get in touch with me uh, if you are interested in you know talking more physics or working with me okay so that's the rough outline so with that let's move on and uh, let's uh, start with the first part what is uh, okay so then one small thing i forgot to tell you is how i would like to run the run the lectures so what i'm going to do is i am not going to talk longer than 30 minutes at a stretch whatever happens so it would be nice irrespective if it will be 30 minutes or less if there is a logical point of before 30 minutes which i can stop and ask questions ask 
you for questions i'll do that if not definitely after 30 minutes wherever i am i'll just stop and then we'll have a we'll have some questions and that that would be very nice if some of you can ask questions because that will keep me uh, on my feet and also it will make things more interesting and as always with everything that i do in terms of pedagogy and teaching uh, the the goal is not for me to you know tell everything that i plan to tell you but it's more to use whatever i'm saying as a point uh, to to hopefully excite you regarding this field and or or even better bonus have a good discussion okay so so both are welcome and that's what i'm looking forward to and i hope that 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 will go well okay all right so let's ask this first question why do you want to study bc okay so now to answer this question of course you have to have some idea of what a bc is without which this question is somewhat opaque and meaningless so let me begin by saying what a bose einstein condensate is i'm going to start literally with very cartoonish definition and we will get more and more uh, specific and rigorous uh, today okay so here is a picture sometime in the 90s when the first atomic bose einstein condensates were realized this is a picture from uh, the cover as it says of the science magazine and what it is showing you is basically a, a cartoon version of what a bose einstein condensate is so a bose einstein condensate is a very interesting collective state collective quantum mechanical state of matter where many many atoms many many particles i'll be using uh, particles and atoms interchangeably uh, please do not mind so many 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 particles occupy the exact same quantum state when you cool such a collection of particles below some critical temperature so in this cartoon these blue uh, particles or these blue soldiers are supposed to and uh, signify all the atoms that have completely uh, gone into the same quantum state so if you know a quantum mechanical state is like a wave and you can see that each of these atoms uh, these these soldiers are moving lock in step which means they have the same phase they are exactly in the same quantum state now these other uh, particles of different colors that are moving around helter skelter you can see that these atoms are in blue color which means they are colder and these atoms that are or these particles that are running around are basically a background gas that is in a regular thermal state with some maxwell boltzmann distribution and they are still there but you basically have a macroscopic fraction this is a very large fraction of the total number of these soldiers here they have gone into this ground state and this is a bose einstein condensate okay so this is like a very naive definition cartoonist definition and now let's move on and look at slightly more uh, um, specific definitions okay so now as i said uh, there is so the idea for uh, uh for bose einstein condensates is that you keep lowering the temperature of a collection of particles that have a particular uh, statistics which is called bose statistics so bosons and when you cool these particles below a certain critical temperature a macroscopic fraction of them occupy the same quantum state so what is this in that sense every atom is in the same microscopic state which means for example if i have a box that is without any potential a three dimensional cubic box all of my atoms will go into the zero momentum or or a large fraction of my atoms below this uh, critical temperature will go into the momentum zero state they will suddenly stop moving on the other hand if i have a harmonic oscillator as we will see most of my atoms will go below this transient temperature into the ground state of this harmonic oscillator okay so when this happens since many many of these atoms basically occupy the same quantum states you essentially get a very large atomic matter wave right or a particle wave and this collective macroscopic state is quantum state is called a bose einstein condensate and already there is an idea for why is this interesting to study such a state basically 
if you think of how you learned quantum mechanics in school, in sorry, in, in, in your courses in your first year undergrad or second year undergrad, you would have learned about a single particle in a hydrogen atom, an electron in a hydrogen atom, or for some very small number of particles. Typically, in some very special conditions, they obey these uh, laws of quantum, or at least the, they obey the laws of quantum mechanics at all conditions. But your manifestation of quantum mechanics is never at very large scales. If you're looking at macroscopic systems, you do not see an very simple manifestation of quantum mechanics. But this Bose-Einstein condensate is in some sense like a direct counter example where your quantum effects are amplified precisely because many particles are participating and collectively occupying a quantum mechanical state. So you will be able to amplify all the non-intuitive features of quantum mechanics. So that's sort of the idea with these with these post-Einstein condensates broadly. So now let's first make an back of the envelope uh, understanding of when do you have those Einstein condensation and what sort of, what do you mean cooling and how, how does it come about, okay? So to do that, I'm again putting up a cartoon here. So let me just resize this a bit. And then I'm going to describe uh, what's, what, 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 how does a Bose Einstein condensate come about based on this very simple cartoon picture? So, uh, what, what is this showing? This is showing basically what happens to a gas of uh, bosonic particles as you keep lowering the temperature. Temperature is going lower and lower here. Um, and at very high temperatures, you essentially have very uh, Basically, we understand this part really well. It's just a, a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution of atomic velocities, or if you want, just simply ideal gas. These are completely non interacting bosons. So you can think of these particles as just billiard balls. But one thing that is interesting is as you keep going to lower and lower temperature, uh, the de Broglie wavelength of these particles will increase. So let us define what do we mean by this de Broglie wavelength of these particles. So what we are talking about is a very particular kind of de Broglie wavelength, where, uh, which is called the thermal de Broglie wavelength, okay? Because we know that at the end of the day, what we know from de Broglie's theory is that all matter, all particles have a wave nature and the wavelength corresponding to that wave nature is fixed by the momentum of the particle and the momentum of this particle that is at some temperature T, we can estimate it very nicely, okay? By uh, just using, if this is just a box uh, of free particles, no potential, nothing, the average momentum you can estimate by taking P squared by two m is equal to three by two kVT, right? So just simple uh, uh, thermodynamics or, or even statistical mechanics then your P, your average momentum scale at some temperature T is nothing but square root of 3m QDT, okay? Once you give me a momentum, then I can actually write a corresponding de Broglie wavelength corresponding to this momentum. This is my thermal de Broglie wavelength, H over T at some temperature T. So when I write it out, it comes to roughly H over square root 3m QDT, okay? Of course, uh, in some conventions, there might be some other factors floating around, but for simplicity, the, the most important thing is it goes as one over the square root of the mass and one over the square root of the temperature, okay? So now, this cartoon, what it is trying to describe is basically the very interesting and important fact that as I keep lowering my temperatures, my de Broglie wavelength keeps becoming larger and larger and larger. At some point, the interparticle spacing becomes comparable or even lesser than the de Broglie wavelength. Essentially, when the de Broglie wavelength becomes extremely large, much larger than the interparticle spacing, basically then you cannot distinguish between the atoms and you essentially have a giant wave, right? And this giant matter wave is what uh, a Bose-Einstein condensate is. And this giant matter wave, complete giant matter wave you get at t equal to zero. 
but at some intermediate temperature scale called this critical temperature already a large collection of particles stop behaving like individual atoms but behave like in uh, matter wave and the temperature at which this develops is uh, called the critical temperature and below this point we say that part of our uh, particles have gone into a bose einstein quantum space okay so let's let's estimate this thing a little bit to get a sense of numbers as to how and when such a thing would happen so to do that let's simply consider uh, what why does this happen there is an important feature that i uh, did not mention here which is since i have completely non interacting particles and i have no potential in this picture the only quantum thing that i have is statistics so when i said once this de broglie wavelength becomes larger i cannot distinguish this comes within this is the idea that these particles are identical and they are statistically indistinguishable and they have this bosonic statistics okay so that is an important feature that allows you to uh, that prevents you from distinguish between distinguishing between these particles okay so with that let us now do a little bit of uh, back of the envelope estimation of what is how does temperature affect things what is the typical interparticle spacing and and how would you make a how would you if you ever you wanted to make a bose einstein condensate what are the challenges okay because this is this was originally proposed this state was originally proposed uh, by einstein in 1924 25 but the first bose einstein condensate in a lab completely uh, controlled manner it was made only in the 90s so it took very long and the first sort of thing i want to emphasizes what is the hard aspect of actually making and studying a bose einstein condensate in the lab okay to do that let's estimate basically let's just take air or air which is mostly made up of nitrogen at room temperature and pressure right so at this room temperature and pressure you can do this estimation assuming roughly ideal gas behavior the molar density so the number of moles per unit volume is simply t over rt and after a little bit of work you can check if you put in the uh, standard room temperature and pressure you'll be able to see that this is about 40 moles per meter cube and if you actually look at the particle density so the number of particles per unit volume at room temperature of your nitrogen molecules is roughly of the order of 2.4 into 10 to the 19 per cc just divide this by the avogadro number of particles right number of uh, avogadro number okay so now if this is the uh, density i can estimate the interparticle spacing as simply if i take an interparticle spacing of size d and take a volume of a sphere of size 4 by of of this size d the volume of that sphere is roughly going to go as 1 over the interparticle density right so the interparticle spacing is going to be set by the interparticle density so if this is one particle and this is another particle so the rough in average interparticle separation i can simply get that by uh, taking a sphere of volume d and equating it to 1 over the uh, density at that uh, situation okay so which means my interparticle separation basically goes as the density to power minus 1 over 3 okay just inverting this relation so now if i look at room temperatures i immediately see that for for this nitrogen atom for for room temperatures i basically have interparticle separations of very large interparticle separations of uh, many many meters right so i mean of course this this assumes that i have such a large room let's imagine for that moment but main point is this is over many many meters okay so that's my interparticle spacing at room temperature now if i basically take the mass of a nitrogen atom and then from that i can take the temperature room temperature and i calculate my thermal de broglie wavelength one sees immediately again after some algebra that this is really really tiny so it's of the order of 10 to the minus 11 meters okay so this really at room temperature you can this picture is completely valid okay now 
what can we do? So now if you want to see Bose-Einstein condensation, as I mentioned, one has to keep lowering the temperature, right? So if you keep lowering the temperature, this de Broglie wavelength will start raising. And at some point, it's going to become comparable to B. Okay. So now, how will you estimate what temperature scale will this happen? A very simple way to do that is to ask the following question. How many atoms can I fit in within a sphere of radius lambda t? Right? How many atoms are there? How many particles are there within a sphere of volume lambda t? It's very simple. I just take the density and multiply it by lambda t q. Okay. So now, in order for the de Broglie wavelength to be comparable to the atomic separations, I want this number to be less than or equal to one. Right. So only when, uh, sorry, I want this to be greater than or equal to one. So the point when I actually have many atoms within this de Broglie wavelength uh, cube, that is the point where I can start expecting this Bose-Einstein condensate state to form. Okay, so this is a very very important uh, sort of back of the envelope number that will tell you whether you will have a Bose-Einstein condensate or not if you take a bunch of atoms and try to lower their temperature. Okay. So now we can do uh, an estimate for the nitrogen atom things that we were looking at as to what should be this, uh, what, at what temperature scale will you start seeing some effects of uh, Bose-Einstein condensate forming. So for that, let's just say that n lambda Tc cube equal to one. So once temperature is small enough such that n lambda Tc cube becomes equal to one, then there are at least many pairs of atoms with overlapping and the Broglie wave. So, and we would expect from a very heuristic way that I've introduced uh, Bose-Einstein condensation so far, at, at this point, we should see some interesting physics of Bose-Einstein condensation happening. So if you take this, and then you can then estimate basically Tc as n to the two by three h squared by three n kb. And this, once T is below this temperature, Tc, you would expect that you would have a Bose-Einstein condensate. Okay. Now, what is the difficulty in reaching such temperatures? Let's just do this uh, estimate of what this should be for basically nitrogen atom. Let's still pretend as though it is ideal gas even at this temperature, and you can write the density in terms of the pressure and volume. Let's still be in some standard room temperature and pressure, and then you can basically plug in this density into this expression. And one sees that for nitrogen atom at room pressure, uh, you, your Tc comes to about 0.95 Kelvin. Okay, so this is just some number, but to get a sense of why this number is difficult, one can ask a very interesting question, which is what is the solidification temperature of nitrogen? That is actually quite high. That is a, <coughs> excuse me, that's about a hundred Kelvin. <coughs> so, what is this telling us? This is telling us something very important. That if you take most matter and start cooling it down, it will first solidify before it forms a Bose-Einstein condensate. What does it mean? It will solidify. Remember that solidification of any matter is basically uh, arising from the competition between interactions and entropy. Basically, your map, your map, your collection of uh, particles at some point prefers to fix themselves and not be in a gas or a liquid state to lower its and lower their entropy. So clearly, what this is telling us is it is extremely hard to keep matter completely non-interacting as you keep lowering its temperature. Most matter, regular matter, if you just look at lower and lower temperature, instead of forming a Bose-Einstein condensate, they are just going to solidify, okay? So it's gas, liquid, and then solid. This is why this 
concept of Bose-Einstein condensation, which was introduced originally for non-interacting particles or non-interacting bosons, is very hard, was very hard to realize in practice. So you have to somehow engineer a condition where you lower the temperature, but still continue to be as close as possible to a non-interacting limit. Okay. And that's the challenge in making those Einstein condensates. Okay. So with that, um, let me then say something else that is interesting that happened in this quest for a Bose Einstein condensate. So it was announced in 1920s, and people were thinking of how would you make one at that time, just this issue that you would solidify before uh, you would ever Bose condense meant that it was just uh, a very theoretical dream. Okay, so it was not very clear how you would end up making a Bose Einstein condensate. So, in this context, a first clue as to how you could make a Bose Einstein condensate or the fact that Bose Einstein condensates could be really viable to be made in a lab came when people were studying um, another very interesting set of uh, uh, collective phenomena of uh, particles basically in the study of liquid helium. So what they found is that liquid helium, as you keep cooling it, cooling uh, a, a sample of liquid helium below a certain temperature, which is called uh, the lambda temperature, which is about uh, of the order of two Kelvin. What happened is that this uh, liquid helium stopped uh, facing any resistance to flow. So basically, if you put this liquid helium in a capillary, it would flow without any resistance. So this new resistance-free flow state of a liquid was called a superfluid, okay? And this was puzzling people a long time. And at some point in 1938, um, along came um, Fritz London, who said there is an interesting connection between uh, superfluidity and uh, Bose-Einstein condensate, and that at least part of the sample of a liquid helium should have some Bose condensation. And this can explain this frictionless flow. This was a very interesting clue, but there was a small problem. The problem is that liquid helium at the densities that one, in fact, this if you want to see why this claim by Fritz London, which was made with a lot of theory and, uh, and it, was, it was quite quite an interesting suggestion, but it had some theoretical backing. But um, to even see it back of the envelope, what you can do is you can just plug in into this expression I have for uh, Tc in terms of the density. Let me see, where did I write it? Yes, into this, if you plug in mass of liquid helium and the density, of liquid helium when it makes uh, just the regular density of liquid helium, you see that this Tc comes to about three Kelvin. So this is a very tantalizing suggestion because this is so close to this lambda transition that the lambda transition might have something to do with post condensation. Okay, but what is the catch? The catch is that liquid helium is very strongly interacting, even though, and, and that is the uh, very interesting part of liquid helium that even though it's very strongly interacting instead of just solidifying, it continues to be a liquid. Not only that, it becomes a superfluid. And this told uh, the community that, well, you could have Bose-Einstein condensation, uh, but you should not restrict it just to non-interactions. Interactions, you have to understand how it plays into Bose-Einstein condensation. We will get into some of these aspects at some at the end if there is some time left. But the <clears throat> But the combination of this original non-interacting suggestion and uh, the original prediction uh, using non-interacting bosons and these possibilities that are suggested by this liquid helium four meant that a bunch of people said heroically that we should really try and make a BEC with weakly interacting dilute gases of atoms, right? So if I keep making my density small, I can be as far as I want from solidification, okay? But what is the price I pay? Of course, there is a small thing that you can do. You want to make your density small and you also want to choose particles of as small a mass as possible. Of course, one of the first things that people tried was to make a Bose-Einstein condensate with hydrogen. And it was eventually done, but the first Bose-Einstein condensate was not made with hydrogen for some 
slightly more technical reasons. But the key idea is that I want to ensure that I can make a collection of bosonic atoms. How are atoms bosonic, by the way? Because they are made up of fermions and they are made up of even number of fermions. Atoms that are made up of even number of fermions have bosonic steric states. Okay. Uh, just wanted to put that out there. So now what, what, what did they want to do? They want to keep the density as small as possible and still try and make a bosine strain condensate. If the density is small, you will not get solidification. But on the other hand, this expression already tells us what is the major challenge then. If you keep the density really small, your temperature Tc at which you will start seeing bosons and condensation is going to go even lower, right? In fact, how low does it go? Hundreds of nano Kelvin. So which meant people had to figure out how do you take regular atoms and, and regular matter and cool it to hundreds of nano Kelvin, which is roughly about 10 orders of magnitude from room temperature. How do you do that? Which meant you had to understand how to cool atoms first. And in this manner, I talk a little bit about this cooling in eventually. Um, so, but, but basic elements of this cooling, let me just put out these words there and we will tackle one by one. The idea is that I've been now talking about very simple bosonic point particles. Of course, atoms have internal levels and these internal levels are usually in many atoms split by some optical transition frequencies. And one way to cool atoms is by actually shining lasers on them. And lasers can have a mechanical effect on the atoms and reduce their center of mass motion. And that's what laser cooling is. Then the second idea is that these atomic internal levels depend on their, their atomic internal levels depend on an applied magnetic field, so-called Zeeman effect. If you've learned in atomic physics, you can exploit that to create configurations of magnetic fields in space, which are preferable for atoms to occupy. Or in other words, you can trap them by using magnetic fields. And finally, the last thing that one needs to do after cooling atoms with lasers and putting them into magnetic traps is a very, very, very old idea of how cooling works. For example, if this is summer in India, you might have a earthen pot at home. How do you make cold water in earthen pots? The idea of evaporative cooling where you let very energetic particles in your sample to leave and you, whatever is left is going to naturally be at lower temperature. And this after this last step of evaporative cooling, I realized that I summarized in like one minute uh, basically uh, experimental and theoretical advances of cooling that took order of 20, 25 years. So I've been, I, we will get a little bit into it later, but the idea is that you, one was able to do that. And this picture that you see finally here, which you might've seen many times, shows how in 1995, after doing these different stages of cooling, the first Bose-Einstein condensate of rubidium atoms was achieved uh, by Carl Riemann uh, and Eric Cornell. And then later uh, with rubidium atom, these are with rubidium atoms and um, eventually with uh, sodium atoms by Wolfgang Ketele. Um, we will unpack what exactly is this picture. One of the things we will do today is unpack what is this picture. And uh, what, what this is showing rough, just as a, a trailer, what this is showing is basically the momentum distribution of a trapped cloud of atoms. And as you go from left to right, you're lowering temperature. And in the left corner, it is still a thermal gas with some maxwell Boltzmann distribution. And eventually the momentum distribution becomes very anisotropic. And this is literally, the ground state wave function of an harmonic oscillator in momentum space. This density distribution corresponds to that. And it shows that all of the atoms have gone into the ground state of this trap, okay? And the last thing I'll say before I take some questions is um, basically uh, the, the uh, density of these cloud of atoms is about 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 15 per cc. You see that's like, four to six orders of magnitude less than air that we are breathing right now. So it, it is really low density and that is why things don't solidify. And at the end of the day, the aim of these lectures is to develop 
a theoretical understanding of some of the fascinating properties of these bosides and condensates, how to describe them, and how how what can you do with them? Okay, so let me take a quick break here and uh, answer some questions. Um, if okay, so there are at least a bunch of questions here. Let me begin by looking at the chat, and uh, unless someone has an immediate question that they want to unmute themselves and ask. Okay, so while people consider unmuting themselves, let me just read. Huh. So there is a question from uh, Swagata, which asks, explain once more why you equated one over the particle density with four by three pi d cube. So all that I'm saying there is, if I have a collection of atoms in some volume, if I have a separation, uh, if, if I have a density of n, then on an average, the separation is going to be uh, such that if I draw a sphere of radius d around a particular atom, right, then this will give me, if d is the interparticle separation and I calculate the volume of this, this is going to be of the order of n over v, right? Sorry, uh, this is going to be of the order of the total volume over the number of particles, right? Because that is precisely the definition of the interparticle space. So I will not find one more particle within this volume. That is my interparticle separation. I, or at, at best, I find one particle within this volume. So this volume over n is the specific volume that is allowed for each particle. So that's the idea, okay? Um, then the next question is, can we find both eyes? No. Okay. Swagata. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I understood your point, uh, and I had one more question about uh, your comment that uh, you know Bose-Einstein condensate, the wave function, uh, gets um, gets uh, gets is the total wave function of a group, many number of particles. Uh, it, uh, so uh, so the advantage is that the different uh, hidden non-intuitive quantum uh, aspects get amplified. So can you please elaborate uh, on that? Okay, so let's see what is the best way to elaborate. Uh, so one example, let me, let me just give you one example of what happens with such things. So, uh, the best example of intuitive. Okay, so um, I can actually uh, take a Bose Einstein condensate, okay, and apply a potential on it. So this is like a part, this is a bunch of particles. I can apply some potential. So I can make very interesting potentials. One very interesting potential I can do is I can take a Bose Einstein condensate and put it in a double well, okay. So there's a double well potential. This is just V with two minima, okay? And I can actually trap a Bose-Einstein condensate, not in just a harmonic oscillator like is being done here, but I can put it in two wells. And now what I can do is I can start with a Bose-Einstein condensate with this barrier very small and slowly raise a barrier, okay? And very interestingly, such, and I can trap millions of atoms, okay? 10 to the six atoms in such potentials. And by raising this barrier, I can really go after a point, I can go into a state like so, where there are N atoms on the left well, zero atoms in the right well, zero atoms in the left well, N atoms in the right well. Okay, one over square. So this, Kind of a state. If you are, if you've been, uh, if you've looked a little bit at quantum mechanics, this is a very, very, very interesting quantum state, right? Uh, this is basically uh, a superposition of two very distinct macroscopic states. Okay, this is no big deal with an electron. If you can make a spatial superposition of a single electron, that happens all the time when the electron is occupying some orbital in your hydrogen atom. But what this is, is this is really a very strange 
spatial superposition of a million atoms. Okay, and this is sometimes called a noon or a, a version of what's called the Schrodinger cat state because clearly these are macroscopic potentials that I'm applying. So this would be uh, of the order of microns. This is very large length scales and I'm delocalizing a large quantum wave in this manner, right? So I'm amplifying a very simple thing that I know works very well, spatial superpositions of small quantum particles works great, but I can do it with a million atoms with a Bose-Einstein condensate. Then you can start asking questions like, which is one of the questions that someone asked, can we find such superpositions in nature and why do we not find such superpositions in nature? Such questions can be addressed by pushing quantum mechanics and quantum effects to larger scales. I don't know if I answered you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I just wanted to pick one. Okay. Uh, so let me quickly take a couple of questions and then come back. Can we find uh, Bose-Einstein condensates in nature? As I said, uh, not very naturally. You have to cool matter down to very low temperatures, of course, uh, and, and you should have enough. Um, the density shouldn't be zero because you can ask, uh, go to space. There is There are no particles. The density is essentially just vacuum. So then you can, of course, not have a PC there too. Uh, so it's, it's definitely an engineered thing. The closest to a natural Bose-Einstein condensate you can find is this superfluid. And in some sense, you can think of superconductors also in terms of a Bose-Einstein condensate, but that's a story for later. Okay, uh, good. So then there is uh, another question, which is uh, when you said we can exploit Zeeman effect for cooling, do we essentially make magnetic traps which keep the atoms far enough? Um, I think I just meant magnetic traps. Of course, the density of the atoms in the magnetic traps, that will depend upon how much atoms you started with, what is the efficiency of your trapping and so on. Okay. Then how does entropy change as gas goes to a Bose-Einstein condensate? Okay. So I think this is somewhat of a very detailed question. I will address not the entropy change as you have a BEC transition, but another thermodynamic observable, which is the uh, the specific heat um, I, I will I'll point to references where you can actually see how the entropy changes so there is a non analyticity in uh, thermodynamic variables as you go through the BC phase BC transition and that's why it's a phase transition but the non analyticity we'll see depends very uh, markedly on what density of states you have for your single particle potential okay so now I think the, uh, the other question is, can you explain once more the non-interacting idea for Bose-Einstein condensate? We are going to go into it in very uh, gory details next. So that's good. Can we see Bose-Einstein condensate for photons in nature? That's a very interesting uh, question. Uh, yes, uh, there, is, there are two things. One is in some limit, uh, one can very, very, very loosely make an analogy between lasers and Bose-Einstein condensates. That is one way in which one can sort of talk about uh, photons and uh, Bose-Einstein condensate. But really, uh, when, when people, if you look for photonic BCs in literature, the thing that people are thinking about are certain systems where uh, you can introduce effective interactions between photons that is more similar to what happens in these atomic systems. These will have interactions as we will see. So in those cases, you can also see a Bose-Einstein uh, condensation of photons. So it is possible to do, but but uh, but but uh, for for that is for you have to have a very special kind of system where you can introduce interactions between photons. Um, and so this is not very. It's not in the sense of it, it's not exactly like a photon gas. All right, so I think I've taken a few questions. Uh, if there are, I think since it's almost again 3.14, I'll move on now. Let's, uh, I'll, and I'll come back for more questions later, okay? Good, so, um, so we've answered a bunch of these questions. So now let me, before I go on to answering the next part, so finish, the, finish off this introduction, uh, let me, uh, 
let me just finish by saying what is really uh, interesting about VCs. I already answered a part of it, which is to Swagata's question. I said, uh, these are macroscopic quantum systems and you amplify quantum effects. I gave an example of that already. And so this will help you understand fundamental aspects of quantum mechanics. Why do we not find you know, naturally occurring Schrodinger cat states and such questions can be answered. Um, the second interesting thing with having amplified quantum effects is uh, we've known to understand now that we can make extremely good sensors with quantum systems. And so you can use Bose-Einstein condensates to sense very small physical quantities, okay? So that's a very sort of applied reason why it is interesting. Then something a little bit more fundamental that you can do with Bose-Einstein condensates is that with these Bose-Einstein condensates of atoms, species of atoms, cold atoms, you get extreme control over every aspect of this system that you make in the lab. This is not like liquid helium where you just take liquid helium and just cool it down in a devar. This is really state-of-the-art quantum optics, state-of-the-art atomic physics, which I will briefly describe later, uh, where you can control everything. You can control the strength of the interactions between the atoms. You can control the effective dimensionality. So because I can make traps of different sizes and shapes, that's again, I can go from effectively 3D to, sorry, 3D to effectively 2D to effectively 1D study very different uh, dimensions. Then I can also put very interesting external potentials, like the one that I just talked about, a double well, or you can even put another potential that is a periodic potential, which is called an optical lattice, which we'll get to in the final lecture. And what one can achieve by doing this control is that at the end of the day, this system is really a many body system with many particles, many atoms that are cold and are very controllable. Okay. Now, as a result of this control, you can essentially make any desired many body Hamiltonian that you are interested in. Okay. Why is this interesting? This is interesting for this very important reason. As condensed matter physics, uh, which is the study of electrons and solids, became more and more interesting and complex, people saw a host of interesting phenomena just of solids based on magnetism, superconductivity, and this whole field, which has been going on for a long time, is called strongly correlated matter, where Everything, the degrees of the fundamental degrees of freedom are well known. It is just electrons and uh, uh, it's just interacting electrons in some lattice. Now, the problem is this is very easy to specify, but in order to actually understand the thermodynamic limit phenomena that you get from such simple fundamental interactions is extremely hard in such strongly interacting correlated systems. For example, one big problem there is if n is of the order of 10 to the 23, if you wanted to run uh, the solution of a Schrodinger equation for the electrons in a solid, that's going to just be impossible to do on any classical computer. So there was a very interesting suggestion long before quantum computing became what it is today. There was a very interesting suggestion from Feynman to design a kind of an analog quantum computer, which is called a quantum simulator, made up of other quantum systems to actually study a hard to simulate quantum system. So now, since I have with these Bose-Einstein condensates in lattices, in optical lattices with such control, I can basically mimic the Hamiltonian of any interesting system that I want to study and basically study it experimentally and understand the properties of the system, which are otherwise impossible to do by say computation or by analytical methods. Okay, so this is a very big reason why Bose-Einstein condensates are fundamentally interesting. Okay, and then of course, in along these lines, there are also very interesting proposals to use Bose-Einstein condensates as in some sense, the uh, fundamental processors of quantum computers and so on. But that's, that's, that's sort of uh, not, 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 let's say the most uh, advanced platform right now for quantum computing. So that's sort of the reason why Bose-Einstein condensates are interesting to study. Okay, so now 
I think we can move on and start being less wishy-washy about things and be a little bit more rigorous and answer the question, what is a Bose-Einstein condensate exactly? Okay. Good. So I'm going to give two answers, two long answers uh, for this question. The first part is going to be a little bit more familiar, especially if you've done some statistical mechanics courses. So the first part is just a more rigorous and uh, mathematical way to describe what I have been saying in words, which is a Bose-Einstein condensate is just macroscopic occupation of the ground state of a non-interacting Bose gas, so an ideal Bose gas. So I want to qualify all of this by really studying the statistical mechanics in some sense of an ideal Bose gas and show how Bose-Einstein condensation comes about there, okay? So towards that, consider now a non-interacting uh, indistinguishable bosons, just point particles at thermal equilibrium in some uh, grand canonical ensemble at some temperature T, okay? And let's call beta one over KBT, okay? And it's also in equilibrium because it's grand canonical ensemble. It also has a chemical potential mu and so it's in uh, equilibrium with some chemical potential part of course the idea is that we are using this for the theoretical description but because all ensembles are equivalent when the number of particles is large this is largely a trick to make our life simpler in terms of calculating partition functions and so on okay so in this situation in describing ideal non-interacting bosons in the grand canonical ensemble um, one knows that the microstates of the system, these are not, you no longer specify them by telling me what is the individual quantum state of each particle, but instead, because these are completely indistinguishable, you just have to specify the occupation numbers of single particle states. So let me use a symbol for this SPS, okay? So in a quantum mechanical system, I've already told you what is the meaning of a single particle state. These are simply for our purpose, eigenstates. These are basically quantum states of each particle of this uh, collection of bosons, but uh, you can choose them to be anything, but the most important uh, class of single particle states that when you do statistical mechanics is just the eigenstates of the single particle Hamiltonian. Okay, so let's call the energy of these eigenstates E mu and let's call these, we don't need it for now, but you can call the states themselves mu. And let's look at a couple of examples of what are single particle Hamiltonians and single particle eigenstates. One example, free particles in some volume V, we just discussed them extensively. In this case, this nu, which tells you the quantum numbers describing the single particle states are just uh, wave vectors and or momentum, which is given by h bar k and energy is just h bar squared k squared by 2m. And the single particle Hamiltonian is just p squared by 2m, okay. This is the single particle energy, and this is the single particle Hamiltonian, and the eigenstates are just this. And these eigenstates are just plane waves. If you write them in position basis, this is just e to the i k dot r over square root v, right? I hope this part should be really familiar to most of you. Okay, so that's one example of a single particle uh, Hamiltonian and single particle energies. Another important example, because we will actually consider particles in a trapped, particles in a three-dimensional harmonic trap, which is very relevant to the experimental Bose-Einstein condensates that I showed you. In this case, my Hamiltonian, the single particle Hamiltonian is P squared by 2M plus half M omega one squared, x squared, omega two squared, 
y squared plus omega 3 squared z squared, right? So this is basically a harmonic oscillator with different frequencies along the x, y, and z direction. So possibly uh, not isotropic harmonic oscillator. Of course, this is a very easy system to find the energy eigenvalues of. Uh, so the energy energies and eigenvalues. So the quantum numbers are just three integers, n1, n2, n3, right? And my E nu, the energies are just given by h bar omega one, n1 plus half, or I can just write it as sum over i h bar omega i n i plus half, right? So maybe I'll write it a little bigger. Those are my energies. And of course, I know the states as well. These are just the product of uh, the three uh, harmonic oscillator wave function along each of these directions. These are just the 1D harmonic oscillator eigenfunctions, right? So these are examples of some single particle states, okay? So now, as I said, uh, our microstates are simply given by the occupation number of uh, these different uh, states. And using the, uh, the distribution function, um, using the probability distribution function for the microstates, one can actually derive an even more important quantity, which is called the Bose distribution function. Right, which simply gives you the occupation number. What is the occupation number of a given single particle state? Okay, because these are non interacting, you start with a microstate and you can actually calculate, you can start with the probability of a microstate in an. Uh, grand canonical ensemble and from that derive this Bose distribution function which tells you the occupation probability of each of these single particle uh, energy states okay and this is simply given by this function right and this is again something that should be familiar it's very famous Bose distribution function okay so now it becomes very clear that if you look at, if you call E minimum, the lowest energy, lowest single particle energy, right? For example, in the harmonic oscillator, it is just sum over I h bar omega I by two. For the plane waves, it is just E nu equal to zero. So the K equal to zero state, that is the E min, right? And Whatever it is, if you have a minimum temperature, minimum uh, energy of E min, then your chemical potential for this distribution to make sense has to always be greater than this minimum potential, right? Otherwise, the occupation probability of the zero energy or the ground state, this will be negative. So this is required for this to be positive, right? And Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Okay. Another related quantity. So mu is always greater than E min. Okay. And a related quantity is basically called this fugacity, which is e to the beta mu. Okay. And from this, using this distribution function, one can write the average number of particles, which is same, which is which is approximately just the number of particles. Uh, so this is in the grand canonical ensemble. And this is in some sense in the canonical ensemble because ensemble are equivalent at very large n. You can think of this average, average n as basically just the number of particles that we have. And we can write n simply as sum over mu f0 of e mu, right? So you sum over the occupation of each of these uh, uh, single particle levels to get the total number of particles, okay? And we can convert, for many of these systems, we can convert this sum over different energy eigenstates into an integral over energies with a factor, which is called the density of states, right? Times F0 of E. This is a very allowed kind of conversion, direct conversion, 
under most circumstances but there is a reason why i'm putting question mark above here that one has to be careful about this at extremely low temperatures so we will come to this when describing the bees okay so now let's look at how uh, basically this uh, bose distribution function behaves and how uh, what happens as you keep uh, going to lower and lower temperatures to understand what a bose einstein compensator is okay so at really high temperatures right your chemical potential is much smaller than uh, the minimum uh, energy that you have uh, in your single particle uh, basically uh, this is something that one can work out from the grand canonical ensemble but for now you can take my word um, but this means <coughs> so this means that if you look at the bose distribution function at really high temperatures it takes a very familiar form which is just e to the minus e mu minus mu over kbt why is this familiar for example if you take free particles this essentially e mu becomes p squared by 2m and this is really uh, you can use this to derive the maxwell boltzmann distribution for the velocities so at high temperatures of course this is precisely the picture that we started with of particles bouncing around like billiards with some maxwell boltzmann distribution for their velocities okay this is what happens at very high temperatures okay but uh, I think I might have made a mistake. Let me let me just check one thing. I might have said something wrong regarding mu. Uh, right. <clears throat> Again, I think I'm making the greater than or less than uh, error. So. Let me get to this part. So if I have mu greater than, sorry, this is really stupid. So if mu is greater than e mu, uh, then this would give me, of course, e to the e mu minus mu will be uh, this would be negative, so this would be less than one, and then you would get a negative occupation. So what I meant here, that was stupid, is mu should always be greater than the uh, minimum energy. So the chemical potential has to always be above the minimum allowed. Uh, uh, wait, I'm making some really stupid errors. Next, let, let me just think for a moment. So, yeah. So I do need a mu minus mu. So I can ensure that by making mu less than the minimum. Okay, so this is my criterion, right? This is my criterion for uh, Bose distribution function to be positive. So that's fine. And what happens at really high temperatures is that mu is much less than even. Okay, so sorry about that. That was an error from before. Okay. So now, uh, sorry, is there a comment? Uh, hello. Uh, can I interrupt for a second? Uh, sorry, yeah, so uh, the temperature is 
atmosphere comes out as a common factor, right? So, uh, what exactly do we mean by saying that at high temperature, the uh, mu is much lesser than uh, uh, mu minimum? So, so, that is again a very good question. So, the idea is as follows. So, the idea is that uh, when you look at this equation, uh, when you actually plug in the Bose distribution function, uh, which is something I should have mentioned, what you get is n in terms of mu and p. Okay, so if I just plug in the Bose distribution function and if I'm able to evaluate this integral, right, we'll get into that detail later. But this equation gives me the number of particles as a function of mu and temperature. I can invert this to write mu as a function of n and p. Okay, so this tells me actually, which is very important, that the chemical potential, of course, depends on the temperature, even in a non interacting system. And the reason is you have to go back to what is the definition of chemical potential. It is the rate of change of energy with respect to the number of particles at fixed entropy. Okay. So now as you go to lower temperature, the entropy is different. So mu will depend on temperature, even if it is non-interactive. Is this clear? Oh, yes, sir. I understand. Thanks. What I mean by saying that mu becomes much less than E min. Mu basically goes to minus infinity as T goes to uh, infinity, basically. That's the idea. Okay, so with this, of course, high temperature behavior is easy to understand. So now, what happens if I keep going to uh, lower? And, and so, okay, one one important thing about this high temperature behavior is if you look at F zero of the ground state, which is E min, that is E mu minus E min over K D E, and this. When mu is much less than e min, is much less than one, right? So that is the problem. Okay. So at, at very high temperatures, there is essentially low occupation of the ground state, and in general, the higher energy states I can really write down as some kind of Maxwell Boltzmann like distribution. Okay. But now, what happens as I lower my temperature, and that is where the interesting physics is. Okay. So now. The issue is that mu starts increasing, okay? But we are always bound by this mu is less than e min, okay? So as t is decreased, mu increases, but mu is always below e min, okay? Therefore, if you look at the occupation of any of the excited states, they have to be less than one over E mu minus E min over KBT minus one, right? So I'm just plugging in, in the Bose distribution function. For mu, I'm just plugging in the maximum value it can take, which is the lowest energy, the ground state energy, right? Now, here's where I can give you another heuristic explanation of a Bose-Einstein condensate. What is happening? So if I keep lowering my temperature, my occupation probabilities of any of my excited states is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. They will reach some saturation above which they cannot grow. Okay. And this saturation value is also getting smaller with as temperature goes, uh, as temperature becomes lower. Okay. As a result, below a certain temperature, I will not be able to fit in all of my atoms in the excited states. And I have to push not just one atom, but a macroscopic number of them into my ground state. And I am allowed to do that precisely because there is no such bound for the ground state, right? So the ground state occupation can continue to increase in principle at t equal to zero, as we will see, it will go to the total, all the particles will be in the ground state. So it can go as large as n, but the excited state occupation is always bounded by this. Okay, So that is the key idea that because of the Bose distribution function, you can push more and more atoms into the ground state as you go to lower temperatures, but that's not possible. You're not able to do that with the excited states. And that is at the heart of why you get a Bose-Einstein function. Okay, but of course, as uh, we showed here, the excited state uh, or, or basically the way that we are writing this function, it tells us a little bit about 
the fact that not only the Bose function, but also this density of states can play an important role as to whether you can, at what temperature you will have this Bose condensed state, as well as whether you can have a Bose condensed state that is set by this density of states. Okay. So now let's uh, go and look at the effect of this density of states and actually work out this post condensation temperature, for example, and the idea of this post condensation. Okay. So now this density of states is very simple. This is again something that is from basic statment, right? What is the density of states? So this G of E D E gives you the number of single particle states between energy E to E plus D. How does that how how this is the definition of density of states? How does one compute that? You first compute this capital G of E, which is simply the number of single particle states with energy less than or equal to E. And then it's just very simple to see that this density of states is simply the derivative of this TG of E with respect to E. So let us quickly calculate it for two cases. I'll not do it in detail. Um, I have it in the notes and this is very basic stat mech and I encourage you to go and see this. So for uh, particles in three dimension, right? So my energy E is given by P squared by 2M. G of E, for example, is the volume of phase space or, or energy space with less than uh, E divided by the volume occupied by a single quantum state, which is essentially H cube, right? So if you calculate the volume of phase space under this energy E, so you realize that this density of states is essentially not a quantum thing. It's, it's something that is there in classical physics as well. As soon as you give me an Hamiltonian, I can actually calculate this. And if you tell me the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, I can calculate this, right? And so this is for uh, for this three particles. It's just v times four by three pi p e cube, where p e squared by two m is e. So it's essentially all the this is the volume of a sphere uh, of radius two m e in uh, square root two m e in momentum space. Right. That's all. And then I can calculate this very quickly after a little bit of work. And the answer for G of E comes out to be square root 2 Me to the 3 by 2 divided by 3 pi squared h bar cube. Okay. And from this, the key quantity is how does it scale with energy? It scales as E raised to 3 by 2. This is telling you two things. The cube here is coming from the fact that we are working in three dimension. And the by two is telling us the relation between E and the momentum, right? It is P E squared. Okay. So using this, one can immediately write the density of states for particles in a box as just V M to the three by two square root two pi squared H bar cube E to the half. Okay. And in the same vein, I'm not going to do this if I have basically a harmonic oscillator potential, which we just talked about with this kind of energy, H bar omega i ni plus half, i goes from one to three, right? Then again, you can do the same idea. In this case, you have to calculate the volume of not a sphere, but an ellipsoid in, uh, in basically six dimensional phase space, which is again, geometrically very easy to do. After a little bit of work, you will see. And if you want, you can look at the notes that will be available on the uh, on the website, and you will see that this leads to. So this is for free particles. Now, for a three D harmonic oscillator, you get G of E is some E cube by six H bar cube omega one omega two omega three, and G of E is precisely E squared by two H bar cube, omega one, omega two, omega three. Okay. So you get, I just wanted to illustrate two very different kinds of uh, density of states. 
but this at the end of the day this gives us what is the correct form we have to assume for the density of states we are going to assume a general density of states and calculate this bc transition g of e can be taken as c alpha e to the alpha minus 1 for free particles alpha is in three dimension alpha is 3 by 2 and this constant c 3 by 2 is just this for a harmonic oscillator in three dimensions alpha is 3 and this c 3 is 1 over 2 h bar cube omega 1 omega 2 omega 3. now we want to take this density of states and go back to our expression that we had for the total number of atoms in terms of the <clears throat> in terms of the Bose distribution function and look at this and look at what happens to this quantity as we go to lower and lower temperatures okay so now let's do that now let's focus for example on uh, on a case where we can ignore the minimum temperature minimum energy right so i'm going to set this minimum to be zero this is perfectly correct if I have uh, uh, free particles, k equal to zero has energy zero. But for the harmonic oscillator, there is some uh, vacuum energy. Uh, so E minimum is not technically zero, but uh, it will only change things quantitatively slightly, whatever we are going to do. So it's all right. So let me keep it at zero and let me uh, look at what happens then. So now this means that mu has to always be negative and the maximum value it can take is uh, zero right with this i can plug in into this expression for n which is written now as temperature and chemical potential dependent the expression for g of e which will pull out a c alpha uh, e to the alpha minus one one over e to the beta e minus mu minus one okay so now uh, what i can do is i can simplify this integral a little bit uh, what what happens is i can basically define a quantity x which is beta e okay and use that to write this n basically as c alpha pull out this kt to the alpha zero to infinity dx x to the alpha minus one let me call bring back my e to the beta mu right as my fugacity and i have z inverse e to the beta e to the x minus one okay so i can write this n precisely as some c alpha kt to the alpha times some function purely of this z because i'm integrating over x and depending parametrically on this alpha so where this g alpha of z okay and this is just some algebra after doing this algebra i can express this g alpha of z as sum over m goes from 1 to infinity z to the m by m to the alpha times the gamma function where this gamma function as you know it's the generalization of the factorial function and it's simply given by zero to infinity dx u to the alpha minus one e to the minus one okay so now this is the expression for g of alpha so g alpha of z now we can go back to this equation because this is n is written as c alpha times kt to power alpha times g alpha of z plugging this back in now we can do some physics to see exactly what is happening as you go to lower temperature so now an important point here that i forgot to make is this uh, integral this integral you can show that this integral zero to infinity dx x to the alpha minus one z inverse e to the x minus one sometimes these are called Bose integrals this integral converges only when alpha is greater than one okay so this is a mathematical property 
that will be very important when we discuss why in certain cases, uh, in certain dimensions, for example, you cannot have Bose condensation for non-interacting particles. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. And now let's work with alpha greater than one, which is true for both the important examples that we have, particle in three dimension as well as our harmonic oscillator. So with that, we can write our N as C alpha gamma of alpha divided by, I'm just bringing the KT to the denominator minus alpha sum over M. This is a series in this fugacity, Z of T to the power M, M to the alpha, right? So that is exactly what we had, Z to the M by M to the alpha. Now, let's look at what happens to this expression as you go to lower and lower temperatures. So now if you have uh, the first point is this function as a function of Z, this is monotonically increasing. as a function of z, okay? And z, remember, is e to the beta mu, okay? Now, at very large temperatures, as we just saw, mu is very negative. Mu is towards minus infinity as t goes to infinity, and z is much less than one, okay? But now, as you go to lower temperatures, mu basically, becomes larger, but mu has to always be uh, greater than zero, right? So that's the maximum value it can take, sorry, mu has to always be less than or equal to zero. That's the best, that is the largest mu that you can take, okay? Which means your Z basically is increasing as your temperature decreases, but Z is always has a bound. It is less than or equal to one because mu is at best zero, Z e to the beta mu has an upper limit, which is one, okay? So now if we call, and remember that mu is a function of temperature, let's call the temperature at which mu becomes very close to uh, one, sorry, very close to zero, and hence Z becomes exactly one. Let's call the temperature when that happens TC, okay? All right. So now, after this temperature, as you further decrease T to be less than this TC, what happens? is basically your Z is essentially frozen. Z of T less than TC, it cannot become any larger than one. So Z for all temperatures below such a temperature where mu becomes one, okay? It's just going to be frozen at one. What happens at T less than TC to this function then? So then you have this slightly absurd result that Okay, times kt to the power alpha when t less than tc. Okay, now what this is telling us is as I keep lowering my temperature further and further below the temperature after which my chemical potential has saturated to its lowest allowed value or highest allowed uh, value but uh, lowest modulus, right? Mu as saturated to zero. As I go below that temperature scale, my number of particles really, because alpha is greater than one, as T becomes closer and closer to zero, the right hand side of this function goes to zero. But the left hand side is a fixed number. I have started with a certain number of uh, bosons and it's very absurd now that this equation cannot be satisfied anymore. This equation predicts that some of my particles are vanishing, okay? What is happening? The answer is very simple. The answer is we made a very questionable decision here when we said N is equal to this. What have we done? Because G of E goes as E to the alpha, this does not account for the occupation 
of the ground state, which is E equal to zero. So what we have to do and what is happening essentially is that once this temperature goes below this TC, all that is happening is really particles are leaving the excited state and are disappearing into the ground state and they disappear into the ground state. And essentially when that happens and when many particles start occupying the ground state below this temperature TC, that is precisely when you get a BEC. Okay, so let me just finish by writing the final expression for what is the transition temperature. First by correcting the error. So the original expression I had was only the fraction of particles in the excited state. So this zero to infinity DE G of E F zero of E just signifies the number of particles in the excited state, but I can always have particles in the ground state. This part is essentially zero at T greater than TC, but it can become extremely large as T goes below TC. And this is the right equation to begin with. And this is valid at all temperatures. And this, now we define the transition temperature into Bose-Einstein condensate as the largest temperature at which when we take mu of Tc equal to zero, we can accommodate all of our particles in the excited states. So basically, we can essentially have zero occupation of the ground states effective ground state effectively and all the particles are in the excited state which means i can write my total number of particles as precisely n excited tc at mu equal to 0 okay and once i just write this de g of e 1 over e to the e kb tc minus 1 and I can use the same simplifications as before by redefining this integral. And instead of Z is now one, so the one over N to the alpha. And from this, I basically get C alpha, gamma of alpha, KBTC. And this is the famous Riemann zeta function, zeta of alpha. KBTC to the alpha, and you can invert this to write down the exact expression for the transition temperature for a Bose Einstein condensate as N1 to the alpha, C alpha, gamma of alpha, zeta of alpha. And these are mathematical functions that can be evaluated easily. Okay. So this is the transition temperature in some arbitrary single particle potential with density of states of C alpha e to the alpha minus one with alpha greater than one. Okay, let me stop here and I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, sorry that maybe I took a little bit too long. I will be a little bit more conscious next time. Um, if someone wants to unmute and ask questions, that will be easier. And then I can uh, also uh, see some of the uh, questions uh, in the chat. Oh, sir. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I couldn't completely follow uh, where exactly we went from in the calculation. Uh, you said that we had to uh, add some ground state uh, particles uh, separately. I do not understand why this uh, density of state does not account for the ground state. Ha, ha. So, so it's it's essentially because of the fact that the density of states has this polynomial form, right? So when E goes to zero, G of E goes to zero. There is okay, only okay, okay. That okay, is I see. okay. Okay, I got it. Okay. I mean, this is not some magic. It's just that uh, I could have started exactly with this proper definition and given you this answer. But this is typically the way one introduces uh, the Bose-Einstein condensate to, to show that, well, uh, as long as you're above TC, you don't have to worry about the ground state at all. That is the main idea. Any other questions? <laughs>
Okay, so maybe I can just look quickly at a couple of these questions in the uh, chat. Ha. So as the Bose-Einstein condensate is one giant function, will you be able to address the measurement problem of quantum mechanics using Bose-Einstein condensates? Uh, well, it depends on what one means by the measurement problem of quantum mechanics. Uh, well, uh, if it is basically the fact that um, I cannot predict the result of individual projective measurements, unfortunately, no, <laughs> because I don't think that philosophical, that that's a quasi philosophical question. There is not an obvious way to answer it using Bose-Einstein condensate, but one can learn about many facets of how to do a measurement um, and very novel ways to do a quantum measurement uh, with Bose-Einstein condensate. That is possible. Uh, we will talk about a little bit of that uh, in, in when we talk about BCs plus cavities. Okay, right. Then, uh, then for the exponential to be greater than one, we would need, yes, that was my papa. I'm so sorry, Shuvayu. Yeah, that was my stupidity. Okay, uh, then Niyati asks, how do we ensure experimentally that mu remains less than E min always? I don't think we have to ensure that. That is essentially satisfied by any bosonic yeah, so our description, I'm. It's, it's theoretically when you describe it, we have to keep that in mind. It's not like you're keeping the chemical potential less than even. It is less than even. Uh, okay, you are just assuming the general form of the density of states to be such a polynomial, right? Yes, I am assuming the general form of density of states to be such a polynomial. And of course, this is valid for uh, most single particle potentials. Of course, if you put a very complicated uh, potential, sometimes you may not get such a continuous density of states and so on. Uh, whether one can have BECs in such complex potentials, that's a very interesting question. Uh, if you have a random potential, for example, can you have a, you know that when you have a, a, an, a potential that's over space that is random. This is very interesting in itself. Can you have a Bose-Einstein condensate then? That's that's a very interesting question. Uh, but uh, but yeah, so, so we are assuming that we are not in such uh, pathological cases, but generically this is the case. And I've also explained it by taking some examples that, yeah, there is.